Larry and I have been married for 14 years and we have two kids. You know, we both really started to try to be more healthy. So he actually started to ride bicycles as part of his exercise regimen and getting fit and, you know, just kind of the more he did, the more he wanted to do. So typically when he would be out riding, you know, say his 100 mile, uh, typical Saturday bike ride. He was always very careful and sent me the route before he left so I knew where he should be at and where where he was at within his route so I had no one to expect him home. Hello? Hello? Yes, I, I have an emergency. I hit a biker. Just Take a deep breath for me, okay? Is he awake and conscious? No, he's a, he has a pulse, we think, but... Okay. You think he has a pulse? So we better not move him. My name's Troy Gubser. I live just outside of Elmwood, Nebraska. Uh, that morning, April 15th, I just happened to run into town to go to the bank, and I came over the hill, and I seen uh, a bicycle, and then I seen the guy that was in the truck driving, and there was two young men standing in the ditch. So I pulled over, assumed there was an accident, and then I seen Larry laying in the ditch. I had no clue he was even there. How fast do you think you were going? Oh, I don't know, 40, 45. We're right here by the low back trail. Okay. All of a sudden, he was there. When I walked up and I seen Larry laying on his side, his one leg was rotated all the way around and they had asked if I had a blanket with me. So I ran back to my truck, grabbed a towel, and then when I came back, covered him up and stayed by Larry's side. Kept talking to him, not knowing if he could hear me or not, but I noticed his phone was going off in, his, in his, a pocket of his shirt. So I got that out. I called Larry's wife through the emergency contact on his phone and and uh, talked to her, kind of told her what was going on, and kept her informed. Shortly thereafter, the EMTs showed up, so it, it all happened pretty quickly. You call Elmwood Fire and Rescue, call 286th Street by the Mopac Trail. Elmwood Rescue's in route. The initial dispatch said that there was one party unresponsive, uh, unknown status. Our dispatch center put the helicopter on standby. When we recognized that he was still alive, you know, he was laying on his um, right side and there was blood coming from his mouth. He was kind of in like a fetal position on his side and I like went up to like his chest and I started um, taking his helmet off and I tried to get like an airway established because we kind of knew that was gonna be one of the biggest issues we were gonna run into was his airway. By the time that we got to the scene, Elmwood had already gotten this guy on a backboard in the back of their ambulance. I could see his chest was moving very deeply and pretty slowly. His jaw was really clenched up, which means that we can't open it manually until we give a paralytic to relax that. We pretty quickly decided a helicopter was going to be 25 to 30 minutes away, so we were going. We didn't want to waste time waiting for the helicopter. You know, we had him hooked up to our, our monitor, watching his heart rate, his blood pressure. One of our EMTs, who's also a nurse, she noticed a change on the monitor of his heart rate. During transport, um, we saw that his heart rate and stuff was going down, and um, his blood pressure started going down. One of the EMTs noticed that he had lost his pulse, so she immediately started compressions. Once he coded, we jumped into all of the immediate procedures for that. Um, at this point, we were only about 10 minutes away from the hospital. Could you call Brian West and advise them that we're running code 99 at this time? When a trauma patient arrests, it's very, very hard for them to come back. So I remember thinking um, that we'd done everything we could, but that we, we weren't able to save this guy. When you drop someone off and at a hospital and you always think to yourself, I gave that person the best fighting chance I can. And I mean, our team really did. We were met by somebody in the ambulance bay who ushered us right inside 
to where a whole team was waiting, the whole trauma team at Bryan. When we heard about Larry's trauma activation, it was um, uh, activated from the field, so he was our highest level of trauma activation, uh, a category one trauma. Even though he was unstable, he was taken to the ICU directly for further resuscitation and care as opposed to going uh, directly to the operating room. We stayed in the room for a couple minutes and we actually watched the hospital team get a pulse back, which was incredible. And then we hung out for a couple minutes and we watched his heart rate stabilize, his blood pressure stabilize, um, and I started to think this guy could make it. He was unstable and alternated between that and making improvements, and we really were concerned for about a couple hours that he was going to, to deteriorate and potentially die. It's just so hard to process, and there's so many unknowns. I think that's the hardest part. And Dr. Marshall said his chest cavity had significant trauma to it, multiple broken ribs. And I remember my father-in-law asking if, if he would make it. And, um, and Dr. Marshall said, you know, we're just, I can just tell you we're doing everything that we can. Kind of going head to toe, he had, you know, a sort of devastating, significant facial fractures. He had a traumatic brain injury. Um, he had devastating bilateral multiple rib fractures. Um, he had concern for abdominal trauma with a little bit of blood in the peritoneal cavity where it shouldn't be, uh, and then some lower extremity injuries as well. So really every compartment of the body, every organ system really is at risk with uh, such a devastating and uh, threatening injury profile. You know, after Dr. Marshall came and talked to us, they said, you know, they're going to send him up to the ICU. And I think we saw him for the first time like 5 or 6 p.m. that night. And so it was after waiting in the waiting room for a few hours, then they did allow us to come see him before he went to have a surgery that, that first night. So Larry opened his eyes approximately 10 days later, about a week and a half later. And then within like just a day or two, then he would actually respond with the hand grasping. So they would say, squeeze my hand. And then he finally did um, about two weeks later. Larry is blessed with a fantastic family and a really strong support system that begins with his wife, Holly, but kind of follows into the rest of his extended family. And it was amazing to come back and uh, check in on Larry and Holly and to note that Larry's eyes were opening and he was following commands and he was neurologically much more intact than the last time I had seen him, which is just very rewarding and just comforting to see him making progress. The first thing I remember is about a week from leaving Brian and um, the first thing I remember is going outside. I remember being very excited to go start rehab and to start the process of getting better again. So Larry is the most determined guy I know. Everything is a goal and how I'm going to achieve it and how am I going to even beat that goal? How am I going to do it faster than I even set the goal to be? Once I saw that that personality trait was still there after the accident, I just, I knew that was going to make a world of difference for him. Larry came home on July 10th, almost three months, five days shy of three months after his accident. First time walking, three months. We left Dr. Samani's office and when he said he could start walking again, he had walked out of Dr. Samani's office and then the next morning <laughs> he comes out of the bedroom and he's fully kitted up, ready to get on his bike. And I looked at him and I said, do you think we can walk first before we ride your bike? <laughs> Larry's recovery has been far beyond what any reasonable person could expect anybody to undergo. It's obviously still an ongoing process and these things take a long time, but it's amazing how self-starting he is, how strong he is, and I think it's a testament to not just him, but his support structure that he's come this far in a relatively short period of time, which is only several months from a devastating injury that I think a lot of people wouldn't have survived through. I stayed in contact with Holly. I was wanting to go to the hospital and see him, but his recovery was 
so fast that he, by the time I got around to wanting to go see him, he was already home. So today was the first time I actually got to meet Larry and Holly. Hi guys. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Larry. N Jacob. Jacob, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Alexis. Alexis, Larry. Hi, I'm Sarah. Sarah. So nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Yeah. Ed. Ed, nice Ed, to meet I you. I drove that big bus. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for holding by. Yeah, when I see him walk in, I couldn't believe it was the same person because from what I seen and from him to walk in, it was just amazing. Ryan Marshall, I was on call when you came in. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so I've been writing for like four or five years, and that was the first accident I've ever had, so thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you for coming here walking. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Just, well, it's a, it's a metal ride is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, yeah. It really does take a village with every different uh, sort of type of team member. That could be nurses, uh, doctors, therapists, and all of the staff that participates through every phase of care in the hospital. Really, we can't do this without everybody uh, sort of rowing the boat in the same direction. I think on a more personal side for Larry, I think it shows the, the, the power of the human spirit really. And I really do believe he would not be with us if he wasn't such an active and fit person before this happened. So every week I go up for hundred miles and I was gonna go up to Wabash and made it 35 miles. <laughs> and you picked the biggest truck in you the did. whole county. To you get... picked well. <laughs> it was a big truck, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty incredible to be a part of that, that just a, a couple of a percentage points of people who come back from this and thinking that we were a part of a team that was able to do this. You know, just it's one of those shocking things, like, okay, how can someone like that endure that much trauma? It really makes me proud of, like, the squad we have and the teamwork we have and all of that that was a very difficult day for all of us that were there and so it was just amazing to be able to see him and know that he's doing so well and like working so hard to get back to where he was i think that it is amazing that all the right people were in the right place at the right time things wouldn't have been the same if you guys wouldn't have been there right away so so have you you've been out to the bike path i have yeah Going, I was going back to that, was it? I saw it one time and that's enough for me, I think. Yeah. yeah. That's Coming back uh, today and after seeing him walk and talk, it's just remarkable that, you know, four months in time, he can be back to riding a bike, working, playing with his kids every day. It's just a God sent miracle, really. I try to do the best thing that I can with everything that I can. Whether it's uh, my kids or my wife or my home life or my work life or being on the bike, it's, um, I just, I never want to say that I didn't try my hardest. I'm nowhere near where I was before my accident on the bike, but it was something that I just had to learn to accept and to move forward with. And we don't get to change the past, but we can change the future. You know, every single day I get to see my kids and that's just a blessing. And uh, I have a lot of work to do yet, but it's nothing I feel like I can do.